Strange things are afoot at the Circle K. That kid is back on the escalator again. And don't hurt. Is my boomstick. Game over, man. Game over. Welcome to the Barking Bin. He is your host, Ben Mason. And he is your co-host, Sandra McKevy. And yeah, that doesn't work the same for you, man. I know. We're talking 1995's Tommy Boy. Uh, we assume if you're listening to this episode, you have already seen the movie. I mean, 88 plus episodes in. I think you get where we're going for here. Um, I first saw this when it hit VHS in 95. Uh, had, had you seen it before? It's one of those very popular SNL movies, man. I put up there with Wayne's World. Yeah, yeah. But when I was younger, um, I kept kind of confusing it with black sheep because they came out around the same time. They, I mean, David Spade and Chris Farley almost kind of play the same characters. They really do. Um, so like th- those two always kind of bled together for me when I was younger, but it's yeah, I'd seen both pairing. of them. Oh yeah. Yeah. No, they, they do a fantastic, um, odd couple for sure. Mm hmm. Uh, so I guess we can let everybody know that this is our August yes. fan pick. I know what month it is. And uh, it was selected by Ryan. Uh, I think this is his second pick that uh, we had after Evolver. So he's getting a bit of a streak going there. I'd say two for two. Well done, Ryan. Okay. Uh, so, of course, we ask all the time, why did you pick this movie? Um, the reason that he had listed here is... Absolute classic starring Chris Farley and David Spade. Probably the most quoted movie from my teenage years. I Yeah, I can see that. I can see that easily. Um, it's, it's interesting, uh, the, the Farley-Spade dynamic. Because I, I'm not a really big fan of either of them individually. But you put okay. them together and it's pure insanity. I love it. Fair enough. I mean, I... Yeah. David Spade has done so much stuff at this point, um, especially a lot of his sitcom work, mm-hmm. that you're probably inevitably going to find some that you do like and some that you don't. Like, he was fantastic um, on the war. No, wait. What was the show called? Just rules of Engagement. Me. Oh, Rules of Engagement. Um, right? So it just kind of depends. Yeah. I don't know, man. This, uh, this movie holds a special place in my heart because, yeah, like Ryan, this is probably one of my quote most sorry the cat just attacked me one of the most quoted movies of my teenage years all right i'm assuming not the same effect for you i watched it like one time when i was younger okay so definitely no nostalgia here for you at all yeah like i enjoyed it Uh, i do recall enjoying the movie i just don't have like a like a big nostalgia or attachment story or anything like that i just i watched it i enjoyed it i moved on with my life I'm glad I got to revisit it now. Um, Jesus. So that, I could, that so I could distinguish it between this and Black Sheep. But uh. <laughs> <laughs> there, there's something I have to say about this movie, though, before we start talking about it, like the plot. And that mm-hmm. is it's one of those comedies that's hard to discuss why it's funny because it's all about chemistry and sight gags and throwbacks. Um, we had a similar issue with airheads I found and that you have to have seen the movie to get why we're laughing at it. Um, yeah. And if I recall with airheads, cause that was one we watched with Josh and Alex as well. I think on stream, I believe and so. Yeah. We had a blast watching it. And then when we were talking about it, it was kind of flat. Cause it's like, how do you really do justice to some sort of sight gag? Yeah, right? you, the, the you visual element is magic. And it's the so, same here. And I was curious about that. And I, so I looked up like the writers. You know, I do the director, writer, blah, blah, blah. I'll do that right now because the director is Peter Seagal. Okay. Or Seagal, sorry. Uh, flashbacks to Under Siege. Uh, the writers, though, uh, Bonnie and Terry Turner. And this makes so much sense to me now why I love this humor when you look at what else they've done because they wrote Coneheads, uh, Wayne's World 1 and 2. They did a lot of writing on Third Rock from the Sun and that 70s show. And that's 
a style of humor that you have to witness and let it sink in. You can't just have someone describe it to you and get the same effect. There's SNL alumni in like every one of those shows and movies. Yep. Yeah. It makes oh. sense. Like it was almost like one of the old um, production company stables back in the day where you had the same group of actors in the same, in like five different movies together. Yeah. Or like, I have to say, like, I can't wait to talk about this movie with you, but to anybody listening, I hope you enjoy this. But if you have not seen the movie, please do because there's stuff that we can't even discuss that's so worth watching that you're going to miss out on. Just watch the movie and have a blast. All right, quick trivia. Okay. Which actor in this cast was in another movie we reviewed, and what movie was it? Oh, God. <laughs> uh, I don't think it was Chris Farley. I don't think it was David Spade. I don't know about Brian Dennehy. No. Wait a minute. I think I have it. Pause for suspense. What is his name? He's one of the suits, right? Mm, If it is, there's more than one. Okay. Well, it's not Aykroyd. Rob, not Rob Lowe. I, I don't know. Who was it? Rob Lowe. Rob Lowe. We reviewed Youngblood. Oh, yes. Rob Lowe, Swayze, Reeves in a very small role. That's right. Wow. (laughs) Second appearance for Rob Lowe, the somehow uncanceled superstar. Yeah, who's not even credited in the cast. Uh, Even if you go to IMDb, he's listed in the uncredited section. That was his choice. Fair enough, but like it's crazy to think because he's such a big name. Right. Yeah, he didn't want to take away from the the oomph of the movie. He just wanted to be a surprise, but they totally messed that up by putting him in the trailers. All right, well, let's do it. All right, buddy. Um, okay. <laughs> Starting off, how how would you, if you had to describe the plot of this movie to somebody, how would you do it? Um, lovable buffoon tries to save his father's company. Fantastic. The IMDb plot says after his auto parts tycoon father dies, the overweight, underachieving son teams up with a snide accountant to try and save the family business. That sounds like a comedy, right? No. No, it doesn't. No, it does to me. (laughs) But I looked at the Wikipedia plot, and it sounds horribly depressing. Um, The movie tells the story of a socially and emotionally immature man who learns the lessons about friendship and self-worth following the death of his industrialist father. He already knows about friendship. That's the other guy's evolution. Yeah, well, the thing is, if someone fed me that plot, I'd be like, I don't want to see that at all. Keep me the fuck away from that nonsense. It's just, it's a weird one because I've tried to explain this movie to a few people and you, I, I couldn't do it justice. You did a very good job, but. <clears throat> yeah, I tried to go with the most minimalistic uh, description I could. Yeah. And you have to with something like this, right? For a, a heavily visual sight gag movie, you can't really get into the plot too much. No. So oh. let's get into the plot. <laughs> That's exactly what I was going to say. On that note, let's get into the plot. <laughs> Uh, The film opens with a young Tommy rushing to catch the school bus uh, and right off the bat, psych eggs of running into a glass door, dropping his history book, dropping his lunch, and then being made fun of by a young Richard as the bus drives off. I actually love it when casting directors find somebody to play a younger version of a lead and it fits very well. And I think this one did. Yeah. Yeah. You don't see it often. I think the only time it's been done this well is uh, Jack Black and uh, Pick of Destiny. That was good. But we cut to... I haven't seen it. Okay, add that to the list. (laughs) Don't add it to the list. It's it's going on the list. We need a musical. Uh, Cut to older Tommy, played by Chris Farley, doing the exact same thing in university. Um... (laughs) I love how it's almost like a similar layout that he's doing, like running through the shrubs, but in this time someone's put up a fence. So he hits that and you get the, that's going to leave a mark. Um, (laughs) They could have just mirrored it, but they (laughs) they made it that that much worse that he hasn't learned anything from it. 
it's also a different environment though um i do like my favorite part of this is as tommy's booking it down the uh the walkway outside of a building there's one guy who he's running towards who like starts to shake uncontrollably not knowing which way to go and then just hides against the wall and screams hey he's a you know he's a rugby student you don't want to get in his way uh fuck man i laugh my ass off at that that was the first big laugh i had at this movie and then after that i was sold i remember that moment i mean he did take time to stop running to to stroll by the females yes uh psych gag too of freaking out because the door's locked but he's been (laughs) trying to push it open instead of pull it open that is such a tried and true classic yeah. But his enthusiasm, the emphasis on it, makes it good. Whereas most other people, you just roll your eyes like, okay, yeah, we should try the other door, stupid. You can't play this role subtly. You have to be over the top. So Chris Farley is the perfect actor for this. Um, he's late for his history exam, going back to him dropping his history book before. Not really important whatsoever, but a nice throwback to like 30 seconds ago. Uh the fill in the blanks. If he got a D plus on this test, and that was one of the questions he failed, was the John Hancock question. Mm-hmm. What was the rest of this test like? I don't know. It would have to be one of the easiest things in the world. But he still gets a D plus, which I find very strange, and graduates college. I actually looked it up to see if Herbie Hancock was a real person. The musician. Because... I'm not cultured. Yeah, I know. <laughs> and? Oh, he is. He's a, a jazz pianist. Mm-hmm. Um, but you're just mean. Well, you're the nice one, remember? Yeah. Uh, party at the frat that night, uh, where it's laid out that Tommy's going back home to work at his father's plant. Uh, and in classic Chris Farley mode we get him going through a table this time because he's so fucked up he passes out and falls through it that man is good at breaking tables i have to say going to is, the is that really an acquired skill you just fall yeah but he falls so well okay <laughs> uh, tommy lands in sandusky ohio and now and a now older richard played by david spade is there to pick him up uh like we said earlier this pairing has always been comedy gold uh, Richard obviously hates him. Uh, brings to the point that Tommy missed his previous flight when Tommy's like, I thought dad was going to meet me here. He's like, yeah, he was. Uh, I do love the garbage bag luggage though. Cause this is all, <laughs> it's all really funny shit, but it is setting Tommy up as a failure. But this is also the first example of why their humor plays off so well. Yeah. Because you see this, garbage bag wrapped with duct tape. Yeah. And David Spade playing the very stern, you know, jerk, essentially, flat out, like, says, you know, under his breath, I guess flat out under his breath doesn't make sense. But he's like, I assume that one's yours. (laughs) Right? Like, it just, it works so well because they play off of each other even when it's just a sight gag. Yeah. Um... The sight gags are what really makes this movie, though. And I'll get into that here, because Tommy ruminates over how Sandusky has changed while he's been gone. Because he's been gone for seven years at university. And and it's really sad seeing how all the businesses have shut down. Uh, And, like, we have Tommy, who undoubtedly is a failure, going home to a town that has already failed. It's setting up a failure. He passed. He got a D plus. He's a fan. It took him seven years. Another uh, great still line. A, still a pass. <laughs> yeah. But there is no future for Tommy, really, let alone Tommy in his hometown. So those sight gags and the the sarcastic jokes and everything, they're, are, they're very well written and very well performed are necessary to bring us up because this is not the setting you want for a comedy and pairing these two with this script is fantastic. Even little things like uh, Tommy eating M&Ms and putting the bag on the dash of Richard's car 
and he takes a turn and they all just run down inside of it. <laughs> it's like you see it coming. Oh, yeah. He's, he's like, that's all we need is melted chocolate in the dash. It's like, well, it's a thin candy shell. He's like, yeah, your brain is. A How is that a defense for it? Because he's a loser. <laughs> like, he's a fan. Oh, no. We don't want chocolate in the dash. That's okay. It's a thin candy layer. Yeah. And? Your, your brain has a <laughs> shell on it. Uh, we get our introduction to Big Tom Callahan, played by Brian Dennehy. Uh, he's going over the history of Callahan Auto and the family ownership. Uh, Tommy arrives, and it's obvious that the execs and banker aren't exactly believers in Tommy as a future owner of the business. <laughs> Uh, like they they try they they try and put on a front that they care but it's obvious they just they're terrified well there's the one suit and i think it's ted okay <laughs> who's so awkward and tommy's like how you doing ted uh you know i kind of lost a kidney but i still have another one so i'm okay <laughs> what's this guy <laughs> It's just so, de- this movie, the setup for this movie is so fucking depressing. Uh, we get a tour of the new brake pad division. Uh, and the the workers, though, complete opposite, complete 180. They love seeing Tommy. And Tommy is a lovable character. I think we all have those people in our lives where, like, they're not doing the best, but their attitude is 100%. And it's hard not to enjoy being around those people. Uh, supposedly this new division though is going to revolutionize brake pads that sounds exciting but big tom needs more money hence the tour for the suits and then we get a scene of tommy getting an office and a lot of people love the scene but it falls flat for me man like you see that big tom truly loves his son uh, richard is assigned the role of looking after tommy which he despises He's a babysitter. Let's not yeah. pull punches. He's a babysitter. One, 100% is a babysitter. But like the whole Star Wars quote into the fan to get that Darth Vader vibe. That's like, not this scene. No. Okay. Well, I'm saying it's still him in his office. Yeah. Fair enough. Yeah. The Star Wars is the next time. When- yeah. Yeah. No, I have that. Uh, next, we get Paul arriving in town. Paul played by Rob Lowe, who's... Very Just a under piece of garbage. He's a piece of garbage, but underused in this movie. He's one of the stronger actors in the film. But I love his introduction is getting off the bus, drinking, standing next to it, and a kid's making faces in the window above him. And he just does that backhand fist to the glass and drops the kid. Through the glass? I don't know. No, it wouldn't happen. Yeah. Exactly. Uh, no, go ahead. It's like Hulk Hogan levels of kicking a limo door. Yeah, we're not in no holds barred territory here anymore. (laughs) This is somewhat more set in reality, kind of. (laughs) Okay, sure. Uh, Tommy's introduced to Beverly, played by Bo Derek, who's Big Tom's fiance. And Paul is Beverly's son, so Tommy's soon to be stepbrother. Paul's demeanor in every scene is fantastic. He does not give a fuck about anything going on around him. He doesn't want to talk to these people. He doesn't want to be around these people. So he just gets wasted. I mean, in these early parts, if you don't know what happens later in the movie, he really comes off as just like, imagine these kids, these are like teenagers. And this one just really doesn't want his mom to get remarried and to move and have a brother. He is so full of teenage angst (laughs) as an adult. Uh, it's fantastic. He's what Tommy should be. Like, he's just, he's failing at everything, so he's just turned to boozing. He doesn't want to be social, because life he, he sucks at life, and life hates him. Uh, so when you get the combo of Tommy and Paul, it's hilarious with Tommy's just like, brothers don't shake hands. Brothers got a hug. And rushes him and wraps him in this giant bear hug. And Paul looks like he's just going to (laughs) die. He's got to pretend to be his wife's kid. Yeah. How enthusiastic would he be? It just, it see, also, it seems really strange that for this plan, which will come out later, to work properly, you think you should be sober. 
but he's just uh, wasted all the time. Yeah. Uh, this leads us to Tommy and Paul's big night out where Paul suggests doing something uh, a little more dangerous. dangerous. Yeah. So where does Tommy take him? Uh, well, the sound, the setup sounds like, uh, like, you know, a bar or a prostitute house. But he takes him to a house. <laughs> you know, one of them. We should do something house. dangerous. Go down to the prostitute <laughs> house. It's Where are you guys one- going? We're just going down to the old whore shack. Don't worry about it. <laughs> it's just, it's just. Uh- <laughs> <laughs> hey, hey, there's a character that talks about him later. Uh, yeah, I know, I know. But yes, no, they they don't they don't go down there. Where do they go? <laughs> they go cow tipping. Yes, they do. Where Paul somehow even drinks more. Like he should be out cold. But yeah, it just continues to show how wholesome Tommy is. Like yeah. his idea of badass, dangerous is cow tipping. Mm-hmm. Like obviously he's a big oaf and he's caused a lot of destruction. But I guarantee you that this character has never intentionally hurt or destroyed anything in his life. It doesn't go well, though. No, no, obviously it doesn't. I'm just saying, like. It, it it goes to show how kind hearted he is. Anything he does, yes, he is. It's because of his of his like failures rather than intentions. Yeah. Um, when we were saying earlier that this movie goes a little bit more realistic than No Holds Barred, this is one example where it is even more unrealistic because Tommy slips in mud and cow shit and gets himself covered, and the cow that he was going to tip over steps on his head and runs away. <laughs> if this That'd were a more realistic movie, it would have just crushed his skull. Yeah, well, I mean, it's got a soft candy shell. <laughs> Perfect. Nice throwback. My thoughts, though, are this would have been a very different movie, and what would the plan be then? Because <laughs> now there- Paul, Paul is the guy <laughs> next to him, wasted, with his soon to be like stepbrother in a caved in skull. <laughs> He's like, if the police question me, they will figure out what's going on. There's a dead body next to me. I kind of <laughs> want to see where that movie would go. But it doesn't. Paul just hoses Tommy down at the gas station. It's funny. You see it Chris Farley doing his maniac sing along and dance. They have Hoses with water like that at gas stations? I've never seen this before. I've never seen it either. There's a few right. things like that in this movie I've never never known to actually exist. All right, then. Uh, we get a montage at the uh, Callahan Auto Factory. That's where we get the Star Wars uh, fan scene. And some more Tommy and Richard banter. Um, well, you get Richard's um, resentment that Tommy was just handed an office, even though he's been working his butt off for years in the company. Yeah. I mean, we got that vibe before that Richard is pissed at how much Tommy has been given in life. And while he's struggling for every little bit he can get. And I mean, um, this is Tommy's, I imagine first time having an office because when he's talking to his frat buddies earlier, mm-hmm. he says, I'll probably go work for the summer on the loading dock like I have before. So in the past, he's done grunt work. He's put in his time. Maybe not in the same regard as like an accountant, but he's worked in the trenches. Well, no, he's had the title of working in the trenches. God knows how much work he actually did. Uh, I would have to imagine that based on how much the other employees like him, they probably... Like, he probably did do his work. Because he doesn't seem like the kind of guy who wouldn't work. And if if he really was like, oh, he's uh, on the docks and he doesn't do any work, the other employees would probably resent him like Richard does. Some of them do, though. Uh, For different reasons, right? But the majority of them seem to to like him and like having him around. So I would imagine that he, yeah. And I mean, really, Tommy probably was made for grunt work. More yeah. than anything. Um, there is that weird scene where he's uh, kind of shut down for making a, a flub with Columbus. 
that yes. bit of confusion, which honestly kind of hurt me as a viewer, man. Like, man, I wouldn't have gotten that. I don't know. I suck just, at geography. He's so bubbly that like when you see someone shoot him down like that, you just feel bad for him. So, I mean, they've done a great job at establishing him as a likable character. But this is where we're introduced to Michelle as well, played by uh, Julie Warner. Um, I really like this character. I kind of remember her being in the movie more, and I really wish she had been, because she seems to be one of the most down-to-earth characters in a movie that needs that grounding. But, you know, we get what we get. We didn't make it. (laughs) And I'm glad I would have tanked that for sure. Uh, But the wedding... I'm sure we could have made it better somehow. Uh, I'm sure you'll come up with something during the episode. You never know. Uh, The wedding is next. We get great bonding between father and son. um, And a really decent attempt at a conversation about getting older and being alone. Uh, Really intense and honest for this comedy. But it it hit me, man. It hit me really hard. Like I thought it was a fantastic thing to insert here. Um, Especially considering they do a great job of also making... Big Tom seem like such a likable guy. Yeah, that everybody loves sudden, Big Tom. You don't know that much about the character. You just know that he definitely loves his son. He loves his like work. And then here's and all the of a sudden this work very vulnerable version of him. It's like, I wasn't ready for this. Yeah, he's scared. And with no one to talk to about it. Like that. Again, some interesting depth in a comedy that doesn't really explore it any further, and they really could have gone far with that. Um, anyway, the wedding goes off without a hitch, other than Big Tom having a heart attack and dying during a father-son duet. <laughs> oh, is that all? <laughs> That's all. Um, effective death scene, too. Like, if I felt bad. I really did. And we didn't get much screen time with Big Tom. But Dennehy is a great actor and nailed this scene perfectly. It it He really does a great job. In that short of a time, you feel like you knew this character. That's, yeah. That is very impressive. Yeah, like you see him play the... Uh, who's the... Oh, God. He was the sheriff, right? And first... Blo- Why am I asking you? <laughs> <laughs> I just, I just want to check. Yes, he was Sheriff Will Teasel in uh, First Blood, and he was a very detestable character in that movie. Um, and it just goes to show, like the scope of his acting. Like he was, he was a fantastic actor. He's so lovable in this movie. Um, fun, uh, fun wedding video too that Richard was filming. And there's that <laughs> again with Ted being ridiculously awkward. Yeah. <laughs> I wouldn't mind getting a piece of that. Why, why would you <laughs> think that's okay to say? <laughs> yeah. The best part is he's like, Richard, there's an edit button. He's like, it's yeah. going to cost you, man. <laughs> Give me that tape, Richard. Well, uh, I mean, on, on the bright side, I mean, Ted doesn't need to worry about Big Tom seeing his comment anymore. Nope. Still fucking hilarious, though. Yeah. Uh, also an interesting transition to the funeral. We're at the wedding. Everyone's leaning over uh, Big Tom as he had died. And when they rise back up, it was everybody leaning over the casket. Uh, loved it. Uh, of course, we're going to get a scene of Tommy uh, in mourning. I don't know if we really needed it, though, because he emotes enough in a scene where everything else is happening, where he would still convey that that feeling. But Is this him it. in the boat? It's him in the boat. It's him, or no? It's him, not him in the boat. It's him walking down the uh, the road at the graveyard, and then it's him walking in the rain through the empty Callahan Auto Parts factory parking lot and sitting on the loading dock. But then How we did get I miss that. Well, this leads into the bonding scene between Tommy and Michelle, uh, who are stuck in the dinghy afterwards. That's probably why you thought about the dinghy. Yeah, I don't know. I'm done. Uh, <laughs> I like how Tommy decides he has to make a move, but isn't really sure what the move is. Um, it's a weird pairing of him and uh, and Michelle, but I like how it doesn't really 
come to fruition or work out that well. Like it seems like he wants it to be something more than friendship, but it stays friendship by the end of the movie. And everyone seems 100% cool with that. I don't know. I think there's an implication that it goes beyond friendship. I mean, maybe he said he was late for her, for dinner at her place. Yeah. I mean, I don't think it's something like, like it doesn't hit you over the head with it, but it leads it, up to interpretation though, is what I like. Yeah. yeah. And I mean, and, and if I'm a bet man, I'm putting my money on that. They do become a couple, but it's nice that it gives you that window. And then he can stop going to the prostitute house. <laughs> For $20, those women will take their clothes <laughs> off and shake their asses for the men kind. <laughs> they get mocked by kids on the shore, and Tommy flips his shit, but Michelle's threats are the ones that actually scare them off. He tries to keep it, like, civil, because he doesn't yeah. want to lose his shit in front of her. But then he just starts yelling at them, because these kids are detestable. Yeah. Michelle's threats are strange as fuck, though. Like, I, I know where you live, and I've seen where you sleep. I mean, I'd be more worried about Tommy's threats of shoving an oar up my ass. I could fight off Tommy. Michelle watching me sleep would be terrifying. <laughs> Maybe they're going to do both of those things at the same time. Oh, Jesus. <laughs> uh, board meeting time. Uh, Zelensky Otto has bid on the business and the board members are split on what to do. The bank can't risk giving another loan to keep the business afloat. So Tommy offers up everything he has to facilitate the loan and volunteers himself and Richard to take over sales meetings. Already you see how much Tommy, despite his shortcomings, does love the business and all the employees. He's no. willing to give up everything he owns as credential to even just give it a shot. Yeah. No, they're talking about the town dying and hit. That's like partially why he's trying to do this, to save everybody's jobs. But, uh, there's, that's that woman, that older woman again, who's like, and that's when the horrors come in. <laughs> they're already there, lady. You just got to look in the right place. Yeah. The prostitute house, uh, road trip. Richard is not having being on the road with Tommy at all. But I love how it's so set up perfectly because Tommy's like, I mean, you were my dad's right hand man. I guess your schedule is pretty open now. Yeah. And this this is where it, it actually does turn into a road film. Like it's a road trip movie for sure. No, I don't think a lot of people know that. It's their antics on the road. Fucking hilarious. But Tommy fails Richard's quiz on company details, stats and policies. Um, we get our first stop. Uh, which is the Midwest Regional Auto Parts, and we get one of my favorite lines because Tommy's nervous and just asks, "Does the suit it make me look fat?" And Richard, <laughs> pure one hundred percent Richard response is, "No, your face does." Oh, that's so good. Uh, I I love going into it that their motto is, "We don't take no for an answer," and Tommy backs down immediately upon the first no. You, you can see that joke coming a mile away. As soon and as it, Richard is saying, we don't take no for an answer. It's like, that's going to be the then. first thing Tommy does. <laughs> yeah, I lo it's still, it works though. Like they say the line, you know what the punchline is coming up, but it's still hilarious. And that's what I was giving it praise for as well with with the, the door gag is they're using very simple, very classic tried and true bits. But their delivery is so good that it makes it feel fresh, even though you see it coming a mile away. Yeah, there are certain elements of Abbott and Costello with this pairing, even Laurel and Hardy to an extent. Um, they, they know what works and they expand on it. Uh, we get, an, a, but I, I guess you could call it a montage of more no's from business owners. Yes, they are definitely trying to, you know, set the tone that they are failing miserably and they're having no success on either of their parts. But this gets us to one of my favorite scenes. Um, at one point, Richard's jargon confuses a client or potential client. So Tommy uses the man's model cars on his desk to demonstrate the importance of their brake pads. And this is a story of a fiery car wreck where an entire family burns alive. <laughs> and Tommy does not skimp on the gory details. Like, one of the detectives like smoking a cigar being like, Oh my God, 
this is the worst thing I've ever seen. And one of the ambulance <laughs> drivers off to the side, just throwing up on the side of the road. And the look on this man's face as Tommy destroys the models is priceless. Yeah, this man is clearly thinking, I'm not doing business with this guy. And of course he says no. Yeah, Tommy has successfully burned his bridge with that company. <laughs> well done. Moving on, uh, they, they stop at a gas station where Tommy's tasked with gassing up the car and filling up the oil or topping <laughs> off the oil. Another memorable scene, Sandro, for multiple reasons, because in this, we've got the Richard part and the Tommy part. Richard's inside the gas station trying to get directions to Davenport from the gas attendant. David they, Hubend? Yeah. Classic Canadian actor. This guy is fantastic. Yeah. Should have been in more, but obviously with a with a role like a gas station attendant, he's not going to be. But I love how he out-sarcasms David Spade. Which nobody should ever be able to do. That man is sarcasm personified, and, and this gas station attendant just destroys him. Phenomenal. Can't find the town because you need a uh, need new map. It's basically, it's just, it's all fact. He's not being mean. No, he's, he's just, just being, reading his book. And reading his book, I love matter of fact. How they do a like a full circle where he says, you need a new map. And then when Richard gives him, you know, flack and essentially tells him I'm laying on the sarcasm pretty thick. He goes into an exact explanation that ultimately ends up with the result. You need a new map. That's like, that's exactly what I said. Yep. And we're back to point A. Uh, Tommy, on the other hand, is also having problems. Different problems, though. It's not his pride being hurt so much as it is Richard's car. Yes. Because he tries to gas up the car, but the car is parked too far away from the pumps. So Tommy ends up getting gas all over himself and hands. I, I have to ask if you notice when he smells his hand and giggles. No, no, I didn't. Yeah, he took a big old <laughs> whiff of that gas and just laughed to himself for a second. Oh, he's such a big kid. Then get, then gets in the car with the driver door open and backs up to you know line up the car with the gas pumps. But with the door open, it hits one of the safety poles and bends the door all the way forward, so it's perfectly parallel with the the uh, front end of the car. I mean, it's kind of Richard's fault too. He was driving. Why do you? Like, if I'm going to a gas station, I'm parking at the pump, not two feet ahead. Yeah. They they skip the oil part altogether because that comes up as a joke later on in the movie, which I loved. I loved the callback to that because they just ignore it here and you're like, well, I guess the oil wasn't an issue. But Tommy somehow has forced the door closed and is just waiting for Richard to come back. No and, way there wouldn't have been some blatant dents in that, but yeah. Oh, God, no. Um and, and Richard finds out that Tommy hasn't pumped any gas because he goes to pay for it. And the attendant's like, didn't pump any. So yeah. He goes back. And he's like, what's going on? I thought you were going to gas up the car. And Tommy's like, well, they, they're all out. All they have is diesel. I have to go to the next station. <laughs> sure. <laughs> sure. And Richard stops to buff a tiny mark on his car door and opens it. And the entire thing falls off. Yeah. And the look of shock on his face is priceless, but only made better by the look of feigned shock on Tommy's. And he just says, <laughs> what'd you do? Uh, there's absolutely no reason that Richard wouldn't get bent out of shape on this. Okay. Now they're coming. Good job. <laughs> that night at the annual Callahan employee, well, fair, I guess. I guess. Uh, the staff fair are, yeah, fair. yeah. Staff are rather nonplussed about the news that Tommy is the one trying to save the company. Figure they would have already known this. You Feels think like so. him and Richard were on the road for a little bit already. Yeah. Yeah. But this is what I was saying too about I don't think he was really pulling his weight uh, on the, the loading docks because nobody believes in him. I think they well, just kind of like to be around him because he's a bubbly, positive person. I don't think they believe he can actually do work. No, they might just know that, yes, he's good at lifting boxes, but not so much selling stuff. Yeah. 
R is it RT? Is that the guy's name? Yeah. Yeah, he he fucking hates Tommy. Uh we also uh, have Beverly and Paul being revealed to the viewers as uh married con artists. Or Apparently they're really bad at it. You don't Yeah. You would think they'd be better at checking their surroundings. Yeah. I mean, they're trying to scam Big Tom out of his money. Uh, again, Paul being drunk the entire time seems like a really big risk. And Beverly doesn't do anything in this movie. No, she's just there. Yeah. But we get to see Paul piss on an electric fence. <laughs> Go fly it. Yeah. <laughs> Another one of those situations where he should have been a lot more hurt than he was. Oh, yeah. Uh, our boys aren't watching the road that night and uh, hit a deer. They break down crying, staring at it on the road, and then decide to put it in the back of the car. Yeah, because they can't just leave it there. They can't leave it there. No. Richard takes the reins at the next meeting, but the client doesn't like him, so Tommy Ah. takes over and has a breakdown. Takes the reins. Mm Mm-hmm. Like that one? No. Okay, yeah, me neither. It was an accident. Uh, that night on the road, the deer wakes up in the back car or back seat of the car and destroys the entire thing. Also, another joke that you saw coming. Yeah, but still works. Well, the car is already missing the driver's side door. Oh, you just you you have to already know by now that that car is just going to continue to get demolished until it doesn't. Though I have that point later on. Okay. Um. But yeah, the, the the car is missing the driver's side door. Uh, the deer shreds the soft top, shatters all the windows, destroys the leather interior, and books it off into the night. So now at a motel, they see an ad starring Ray Zielinski, played by Dan Aykroyd, uh, promoting his car parts business. And there's like 30 moths just flying around in the background. This is the first time I've noticed that. And they, they verbally acknowledge it. And I for, so, I for some reason, I just don't remember that part of the movie. Yeah, because Richard says, like, we're not sleeping with the window open. It's attracting the moths. Yeah. Tommy asks for help on his sales pitch, and Richard refuses. It's a weird moment of growth for Tommy. I think probably one of the first ones, or a second one after the meeting with the suits where he volunteers to put everything up. Uh, And Richard just shoots him down. Uh, And then Tommy does the fat guy in a little coat bit where he puts on Richard's coat and dances around singing. Mm -hmm. And. Richard does find it funny. You're like, okay, a moment of levity between the two. We start to see that connection. But then Tommy accidentally rips his coat in half and we're yeah. back to square one. Yeah. It's just, it's it's a little bit of a tease of their growing friendship and then an abrupt, nope, not yet. Yeah. You gotta wait. And that's why we have the next morning scene where the two start to bond during a car sing-along of Superstar by the Carpenters, which is a fucking fantastic choice. (laughs) But the hood flies up, blocking the windshield and sending them veering into oncoming traffic. And the cause of this? Tommy did top up the oil in the car, but left the can in place. Um, I love what you were saying before. I love the constant car jokes. Um, I also like the immediate confrontation between the two. Like Tommy gets mad at being called worthless. Richard's mad because Big Tom was like a father to him, but Tommy was, just took his father for granted. Character it, development in an SNL comedy feature film, not exactly a common occurrence. And it's actually done very well because you start to see that Richard isn't necessarily angry that Tommy was kind of given everything. Mm hmm as much as that he was given nothing and had to work so hard for it. Right. And it's a very thin line to distinguish between the two, but it's done so well and it's subtle. I mean, yeah. and, and, and people make fun of Tommy constantly to his face, calling him a failure and things like this, but it took Richard to call him worthless where you saw, a serious side come out and he gets very angry about it and says right up, don't call me worthless. Well, yeah, I mean, it makes sense. He's, he's clearly frustrated. I, this is a, this is a big trigger after so many failed attempts, obviously worried that the business is going to go under. He's actually opened up to Richard saying like, I need help. Like I I need you 
to help me with this. And it's just kind of reached a boiling point. So it kind of makes sense that all three of them flip their lid. In what? All, th- all three. Oh, fuck. <laughs> that actually took me a second. You <laughs> um, I do have to say, though, this scene is fantastic because there is so much drama happening in one of the funniest scenes in the movie. And this, uh, it, it leads to the fight, which is another great part because Richard just nails him with a few good punches, but it's that, <laughs> it's that connection to the face with a two by four out of nowhere. That makes me laugh out loud. Every time I've seen it, I know it's coming and it's, it's not still- just that it's the one, two combo of just out of nowhere, hitting him with a two by four. And then all of a sudden he's just like, Ooh, dinosaur park. Mm-hmm. <laughs> like completely just yeah i hit him with a two by four let's move my attention elsewhere it's just so great yeah it's 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 the 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 shift from realistic drama to unrealistic comedy violence like it happens so fast that your brain can't clock it properly and your reaction is like well that's pretty fucking funny because yep. we know he's fine and they move on so quickly, like, again, with the comment of, ooh, you know, Dinosaur Park. Yeah, they don't let it rest. You can't think about it. You can't think about it. You can't sit there and be like, man, he should be a lot more hurt. It's like, nope, nope, got to move on. And yeah. it's, it's absolutely fantastic writing. Because it's, ooh, Dinosaur Park. Cut. They're both sitting at the uh, restaurant table and not angry at each other anymore. You can tell they're both apologetic without actually saying it. I do love how I was like, and yeah, my face really hurts. Like, not up here and not down here, but right here. And he's the like, yeah, I hit like, you oh, in the I shoulder. Like, shoulder. My shoulder and the shoulder doesn't hurt at all. <laughs> and then the the server walks up. She's like, What can I get you? Oh my god, what happened to your face? The it's giant so, welt. I say it again, it's so predictable, but it's so good. Yeah. And like, we're getting a series of really good scenes here because this is where Tommy uses his uh, people skills to convince the server to open up the kitchen and have someone make him chicken wings. Mm. It's kind of weird, though, because he uses that dinner roll as an interesting technique and just obliterates it in front of her. Yeah. But a solid, like, again, a solid pep talk from Richard after seeing what Tommy can actually do when he's relaxed. He's got street smarts, not book smarts. So let's use those moving forward. And he's, he does. He has a way, like you said, with the workers at the, the auto parts factory. He has a way of connecting with people that most business types don't. Mm-hmm. Uh, the manager at their next stop doesn't want to buy the contract because the brake pads have no guarantee on the box. Um, I thought it was kind of funny, but I really enjoyed Tommy entering his chicken wings end state and convinces him to sign the deal. Like, all I know is uh, I bought a guaranteed piece of shit. Like, that's a great line. They're buying a guarantee. They're not buying the product. Mm-hmm. Um, meanwhile, po- Paul, <laughs> good old Paul, Paul formulates a plan to sabotage the trucks delivering the parts. So Tommy can't save the company after all. And I guess his plan is to shoot the gas tanks and make them explode. I thought he was just going to try and shoot the tires out, but uh, I guess gas tank would be more long term. Yeah, and it, it doesn't work out. And I love the reason why it doesn't work out. He has a rifle with a scope and he can't get a proper sight. So he tries to sit in his car and close the door and use the door as a rest. But when he closed the door, the automatic seatbelt uh, glides back, wrapping the gun to his face, which... <laughs> He then pulls the trigger in the confusion, shoots the chain of a Callahan auto parts sign, which falls, breaking the chain that's holding the guard dog and allowing the dog to jump into Paul's car and attack him. That's SNL comedy. Yes. Doesn't really fit here. It's definitely much more like Wayne's world I, I Actually, I would say Austin Powers. I would see that in an Austin Powers film. But it is funny. It's also nice to see Rob Lowe do this kind of comedy because he doesn't often. Uh, yeah, he that does night, a good job of it. Yeah, he's great. He's great in this movie. Uh, that night at the motel, Richard tries to masturbate to the sight of a woman swimming in the pool, which is fucking weird. 
Mm-hmm. And Tommy catches him and delivers some pretty good puns. Yes. Uh, I, I like things like, gee, I wonder if she goes it with one of the Yankees. <laughs> or as they're going to sleep. Who's your favorite of the little rascals, Richard? Alfalfa or Spanky? Like Juvenile comedy works between these two. Yes. I don't know why, but it does. But the boys I think it's, are- it's more in Richard's responses than yeah. it is in the puns because the disregard. Richard doesn't even try to defend himself. He's just like, all right, let's just go to bed. Like he's just trying to avoid it rather than denying it. And that's yeah. what makes the actual puns hit so much better. Yeah. The uh pseudo acceptance as opposed to defense. Yep. Uh the boys are on a roll with sales now. Um we get a road and sales montage ending with them arriving in Detroit. Uh, Paul's new plan is to change the sales figures in the Callahan computer system. Uh, we do get another really good sight gag here of him uh, almost being caught by Michelle. And he pretends he's on the phone with Beverly and then goes and like sits on the t- uh, a desk leaning back and just talking to Michelle for a bit. But he's leaning against uh, one of those pneumatic tubes which grabs a hold of his shirt and just tightens it up. And you can see it's starting to choke him a little bit. And he's pretending like everything's fine until it just rips the shirt clean off his body and sends it up the tube. And it's yeah, a But really- it's like Richard's response. He just gets up and walks away like, oh, I guess it's time to go. Like, he doesn't I, freak out. He if doesn't I don't overreact. acknowledge it, it didn't happen. Yeah. yeah, just gets up and walks away. Although I will say, he had like 30 seconds on that computer, changed like two lines. <laughs> yeah, no way he did that much damage yet. No, we just have to know that was the plan and that he did something. Uh, okay, I want to talk about the car because you okay. said a- as we go through the movie, we know this car is just getting destroyed, and it is. But it it gets destroyed as Richard and Tommy's relationship deteriorates, as it start they start building that bond up they start patching up the car. So I, I'm definitely looking into this way too much, yes. but, but you, the, the car, the, the state of the car follows the state of their relationship, their friendship. And I really enjoy that because the car really is a character in the movie. And it's, it's just something that they, the two of them who hate, well, not hate each other, but don't see eye to eye on anything are in all the time. So it, it, it makes sense that it would have the same path as the two. How are you going to be driving around in that car trying to sell car parts? They never park next to the building. <laughs> no, they shouldn't. Yeah. Uh, we get the housekeeping scene. Uh, I don't know what you want to talk about here. Just Tommy being asleep and Richard pretending to be housekeeping staff. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, it's okay. But it's just a scene to reveal that they've hit their sales goal. Um, and again, here, like the chemistry between the two, I would argue is on par with Jim Carrey and Jeff Daniels and Dumb and Dumber. Maybe better. Uh, no, but, I wouldn't go that far. Mm, that's fine. I am. All is not well, though. Uh, Paul's plans worked. Deliveries are fucked up and they can't make the payment to the bank anymore. So they have to sell to Zelensky. And his plan is to just shut everything down and only use the Callahan name in his stores. Again, Michelle being the grounded character in this movie fully takes blame, even though she knows she did everything properly. Uh, She and Tommy get into a bit of a, I wouldn't say an argument, but a heated debate and she quits. But at the airport, as she's trying to fly home, well, her hometown anyway, Uh, She spies Beverly and Paul making out and groping each other and runs to notify everyone else. I thought that was her hometown. Was it? Tommy talks about when her brother and him were younger and used to do stuff. That's right. Where is she going? Is she going to visit her parents? Maybe, because she does say, like, when my parents moved away, he had to get a real job. So That's what it was then, yeah. Whatever. She's going on a trip. It doesn't matter. But it, it also stopped... Where? Because I'm trying to remember, like, why would Beverly and Paul be at the airport? Uh, they're they're going to meet with Zelensky. Yeah, but I felt like they were at the same flight or something. And he's in uh, Chicago. 
Anyway, uh, that night, Tommy's driving while Richard's slamming beers in the passenger seat. Richard vomits and causes Tommy to veer all over the place, which catches the attention of the police. And Tommy's solution to being pulled over is both of them bursting out of the car, waving their arms, wildly screaming about killer bees, and the cops freak out just take off. This is uh, maybe the one scene more than any others in this movie that didn't sit well with me. I remember liking it a lot as a kid, but yeah, today, no, not at all. What? Like, uh, why didn't it work for you? I don't know. It's just too ridiculous, I guess. And at one point, Tom even says, like, he looks up after the police left. He's like, oh, my God, that actually worked. And I think he's speaking more for the audience because that's what I was thinking. There's no <laughs> way to- yeah, whatever. Uh, Tommy has a plan to tell Zelensky that the company just isn't for sale. So next stop, Chicago. That one kind of came out of nowhere for me. It doesn't make sense because they're going to go to business anyway. Uh, at the airport, Tommy leaves a message apologizing to Michelle while Richard fails to buy plane tickets. And do you notice anything weird here in this scene? Uh, the lady that he's talking to has her eyes so wide open. Mm-hmm. It just threw me off. Is that all? Um, I don't know what you're hinting at. It's just, it's factual. Uh, a different point in life where going to the airport was completely different than it is today. He's buying tickets at the gate. Well, he's trying to buy tickets. They don't have it. Yes, but you it was a time when you could you just walk to the gate where the plane was waiting and buy tickets and get on. Okay. None of this going to get your boarding pass, going through security, going to your gate waiting. You just got there for when the plane was going to leave and you go up buy your ticket and walk on the plane. Sounds good. Also, the two just buy off flight attendants and get their uniforms? Yeah, I don't know. I really don't, because Tommy does ask, do you have any money? But then when they get on the flight, the the, the actual flight attendant is like, oh, yeah, we were going to be short-staffed. So were those flight attendants, did they pay them off that were supposed to go on another flight just to get their jackets? <laughs> I, don't I don't know. know. But also, like from the flight attendant's perspective, be like, yeah, of course you can buy my issued uniform that I need to do my job. Yeah, it just it it didn't make sense to me. But anyway, and then the flight attendant that they do talk to on the plane doesn't know her coworkers. No, but we get uh, Richard instructed or basically directed Tommy for the takeoff instructions, which they botch horribly. Uh, Richard dropping the R word, basically instilling fear in the passengers. Tommy almost chokes himself out with a life preserver. Uh, then they uh, change in the uh, the airplane bathroom and head to see Zelensky. We get more psych eggs of Tommy trying to change in that bathroom. His tie getting caught in the toilet and him bursting through the door half naked was admittedly pretty fucking funny. Yes. Now that that lands with me more than like, say, the bees, because it's more of a, I guess, realistic thing for a big clumsy oaf to have issues with that small of a bathroom. Yes. Tommy accidentally starts a bank robbery while looking for Zelensky uh, with the single line of, all right, everybody, this will only take a second. One thing you don't yell in a bank. Uh, They meet up with Zelensky in an elevator and the meeting begins. Um, And this is where we find out that Zelensky is actually just a piece of shit businessman. And indeed his intent is to own the Callahan name, but shut down the business. Mm -hmm. Um, We had to reveal that Richard wears a hairpiece uh, and then a surprise reveal of Zelensky entering a meeting with Beverly and Paul, which we should have assumed was coming, but just the visual of him opening the door to the boardroom and seeing them inside waiting to sign the papers with the other suits from previous in the film was a pretty good reveal. That um, didn't feel like a reveal to me at all. That's fine. Michelle shows up and tells Tommy and Richard about who Beverly and Paul really are. How'd she find them? I don't know. I have no idea. They're just sitting on a broken bench on the street in Chicago. Tommy fakes wearing a bomb to gain access to the building again. 
And this time he crashes the meeting, but with a news crew. Uh, he interviews Zelensky on live TV and uses his public image against him, forcing him to agree to help the American working man by signing a deal to buy half a million brake pads. And Zelensky does it. He agrees to it, but only because he's going to buy the company anyway. But it doesn't actually work out that way as Beverly and Paul's true identities are revealed, rendering the deal void. So Paul being Paul makes a break for it, ends up caught in a test car crash and a car seat test, dropping a sandbag on his groin. And the Good creepy callback part, because Michelle used her connection with her brother being a police officer to look up the yes. police report for, uh, I don't know, Paul Rob and Lowe's character's name. Yeah. Do you find it weird that Zelensky hits on Beverly anyway? Immediately. Immediately. No. no. Zelensky seems like that kind of guy. If he wants something, he just goes for it. He doesn't care. Even though wanted criminal, like you think the police would try and arrest her anyway? The police are neglecting her entirely, and it's all being pinned on Paul. Exactly. Oh, uh, well, Tommy's presented as the uh, the new president of Callahan Auto. And finally, everybody has faith in him. And I love how his rallying speech includes, RT, I lost my virginity to your daughter for crying out loud. <laughs> Rob, you were there. And Rob, who's standing next to RT, just like nervously GTFOs. Yep. And Tommy's back in the dinghy in the lake. Time for a monologue to his father's spirit. Yeah, he's stuck in the lake. The wind picks up, helping Tommy get to Michelle's place for dinner on time. And we roll credits, end of movie. Um, I believe that this movie really fell apart at the end. It's a little quick yeah but they really, i mean if you're they, watching this movie for the conclusion then you got your priorities mixed up because it's about the journey yeah yeah it's basically you're along for the ride and then it wraps up with and everything worked out roll credit. yeah along the ride yeah. yeah yeah unintentional but i'll take it i don't know man um i have a lot of happy memories with this movie and the parts that really hit me hard back then still do today, but it's kind of lost some of its pizzazz for me. Okay. How do you feel about that? Well, I think I, I can mirror those statements, although I don't see it as necessarily that bad of a thing. Yeah. Well, I, I mean, know, like, I have to agree with you. I'm confident that as a kid, I loved the scene with the bees. And now it falls flat for me. But even despite that, I have a bigger appreciation for a lot more of the subtleties, especially the the development of the relationships between, say, Richard and Tommy, than I did when I was a kid. So it kind of balances out in regards to movie quality, just kind of shifts it to a different tone for me. Yeah, that's that's a very good point. Uh, I, I, I still enjoy it immensely, but now for different reasons. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Uh, do you want to get into uh, money? Sure. Uh, looking at this cast, but also realizing it was 1995, how much do you think the budget was? I'm going 10 million. Double that. It was 20. Okay. Um, the gross, though, where do you think that ended up? 37. A little bit less, man. It's 32.7. Okay. So not exactly a success. But it is a cult classic, so I'm sure it made a fair ton of money on home video. Um, the the numbers there don't really surprise me that much. Uh, what really does surprise me are the ratings for the movie. Okay. Uh, IMDb, I'm just going to say right now, it got a 7.1 out of 10. That's a very good score. It is a very good score. Things take a weird shift when you go to Rotten Tomatoes, though. Uh, the critics, you take a guess. I'm going to give you a hint. It's not 7.1. 42. 41. Oh! I, I don't think that's fair. No, uh, no, that's entirely too low. I also don't think the audience score is fair. Take a guess at that one. 86. 90. Yeah, no, that's that's also too high. I, I think the IMDb one is probably the most representative of this actual film. Yeah, for once, they're actually the closest. Yeah. yeah. <clears throat> what do you think in awards? Hop into least favorite character? Okay, 
So, uh, of course, we start off with Ryan's. Yep. And I don't know if I can disagree with him entirely for this one. He wrote, honestly, can't pick a bad performer here. Every character in this film played their part perfectly. Um, okay. Uh, I had trouble picking two, but I didn't go for bad performance. I went for least favorite character. All right. And I don't think there's any other option than Beverly played by Bo Derek. Um, and it's because the character was so pointless and so shallow for somebody who I believe can actually act. You could have cast anybody in that role and it would have had the same effect. It was just, it should have been a better character and it just wasn't, there was nothing to work with there. So, eh. They theoretically don't even need the character of Beverly. Um, you could have kind of amalgamated the two of them into one character. Perhaps just make Beverly, say, the criminal on yep. her own. Yep. Obviously, you would need some rewrites. But it really does feel like Beverly is just there because they need a female to marry Big Tom. And then yep. Paul does everything else. It does take away from an easy reveal, though, uh, as to... Oh, they're in on this together. I mean, there's other things that could have been done. A document left out, a conversation overheard or something. Yeah, right? for sure. That's why I said there would be some required rewrites, of course. But yeah. it really does feel like they have had to stretch these two characters, like one character into two for this. Yeah. Essentially just to have, right, Beverly there to be the female to marry Big Tom and then Paul to do everything else. What, uh, who was your least favorite? I also went with Beverly, yeah. um, Bo Derek. I don't think her performance was necessarily that bad. It wasn't. There's just nothing to do. Exactly. The character outside of marrying Big Tom and, and then being just, in a bathing suit. And then just being there for yeah. the rest of the movie. Most of her scenes, she's just there with the other actors. Yeah. Right? So yep. she does a fine job, but she's almost entirely like a useless character outside of being the one to get married. Mm -hmm. Who did Ryan have for a uh, favorite character? So Ryan had Chris Farley. That dude's energy and physical animation was perfect for this role. And it's easily his best movie in my opinion. I mean, you could easily make that argument. Yeah. What did you go with? So this is actually a really tough one because uh, I wanted to mention it earlier. Uh, we kind of hinted at it with the last award. This is a stellar cast. Mm -hmm. Everybody that is cast for their role plays that role fantastically. Again, Beverly is perhaps the only one. Even minor roles, like the gas station attendant, they knock it out of the park. Tommy's frat friends even have like a perfectly fine appearance for their couple of scenes. Yeah, and their lines are delivered really well, too. They made me laugh a few times. Exactly. So picking a best is really difficult, but I'm going to go with Richard, uh, David Spade. And I think it's primarily because of his growth in regards to the vulnerabilities that he experiences. I mean, he admits to Tommy, like, you know, even if we fail, you know, you came out of this with a friend and I know you have a lot, but I don't really, right? Like, yeah. I, I don't know if there's a wrong pick for best choice, um, but that's the one I'm going to go with just because it's a tough award, man. Yeah. I was going to go originally with um, Michelle. Okay. Uh, just because she is the most down to earth and realistic character in an unrealistic film and makes it work. However, I changed my mind and went with Tommy for the similar reasons that you picked Richard. He's a big, dumb oaf, but when he's able to show you that vulnerability, like I said before, when Richard calls him worthless and you just see the raw human emotion come through and you see that all the insults that he's been taking over his life do hit home. And he has to just brush them aside or take them in and work through it and still be that happy-go-lucky, funny guy. Like That's a lot of character depth in one scene. And 
I'm not just saying it's like best performance because it's, I don't think it is. I just think that those elements of that character, I did not expect and yeah. make the character that much more enjoyable. And actually yeah. it, they prompt questioning for answers that I will never get, but they actually made me think about character depth in a Chris Farley film. So yeah, it's Tommy. It's even crazier when you think about how well the writers like mirror reflected the growth with yep. Richard growing socially, which is Tommy's strong suit and Tommy gaining confidence and, and just knowledge that Richard has, right? Like the two of them play off of each other so well as characters, but then they also grow because of each other in an almost perfectly mirror reflection. Yeah, and we also have to acknowledge the performance of the car. <laughs> the the growth that that character went through was phenomenal. Sure. <laughs> what was uh, Ryan's uh, memorable line? Uh, my whole life sucks. I don't know what I'm doing. I don't know where I'm going. My dad just died. We just killed Bambi. I'm out here getting my butt kicked, and every time I drive down the road, I... I want to jerk the wheel into a god darn bridge of boom it. Wow. Good. I completely butchered the end of that, but I was trying to give it emphasis. So that is his favorite line. Cool. Um, this is not my favorite line. It's just a memorable line. And every time someone mentions Tommy Boy, that goes through my head. And it's just, that's going to leave a mark. It has no weight to the movie whatsoever. <laughs> It is just a mem like the most memorable line in the movie for me because it sets up like Tommy as the the oaf, the goof who's always getting injured. Is that when he walks into the um, forklift, the raised uh, crate? Yeah, that's one. Uh, we first see it, I think, when he runs into the fence at the beginning, and then again he runs into uh, a glass door at one of the the potential client's offices. It's just a recurring line. Oh, okay. Yeah, I didn't really notice that they used it multiple times. Yeah. I, it stood out the most for me in that one because, like, it became a focus for a few seconds because it even, like, stops. But I'm sure, yeah, it could be used multiple times. What did you have? Man, mine is so early in the meeting or uh, in the movie, and it's the first meeting between Richard and Tommy. Okay. And it's just, it's... Just again, Tommy's innocence and Richard's just cutting like uh, wit. And Tommy's like, it takes a lot of people seven years to finish college, and Richard just says, "Yeah, they're called doctors." Yeah, that's that. That was a very close second for me. Yeah, I love that one. Right, and I'm sure that that's one of the more um, missed lines in the movie because it happens so early, and you might even just be caught off guard, not knowing what type of humor to expect out of it. And it's quick. They don't really let you linger on it at all. But I just love that line. Yeah, it's. I think that's the. It epitomizes the relationship between the two early on. You're like, mm -hmm. okay, this is exactly who these two are to each other. Where do we go from here? Yeah. Yeah. With perfect delivery by both Chris Farley and David Spade, like it's fantastic. Yeah. Uh, Ryan's memorable scene. Uh, scene in the diner when he's trying to convince the waitress to serve him chicken wings. I still laugh my ass off hard when this scene hits. Yeah. It, I, it's a great choice. No real arguments there. Um, is, is that yours as well? Yeah. It's not necessarily for the chicken wing part. I actually find that part a little annoying because I find his quote unquote sales pitch to get the wings pretty shitty if I'm being mm -hmm. honest, but it's almost entirely for when he's sitting there talking about how his face hurts and the sight gag of him having the large bruise on the side and Richard telling him, no, 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 it's not, no one will notice. It's fine. Whatever. Nothing. And then the waitress, of course, predictably, yeah. but also still hilariously walks up and is like, oh my God, <laughs> what the hell happened to your face? Yeah. It's so good. Yeah. That's quite good that's up there for me too uh i i also i do enjoy the the intro of paul and just punching that window but well, then he also like is it like a milk carton he's drinking yeah. he like crumples it up and throws it in a passing baby carriage yeah 
it's he's just such a fucking scumbag. I love it. But uh, it, the most memorable scene for me by far is uh, Tommy enacting that fake car crash with the model cars on the client's desk. It, it's just it. I see what he's doing at the beginning. You can kind of go along with it. And then he's doing all the voices for the characters. And then he just smashes them together. Pieces flying everywhere. Then he takes an actual lighter and sets one ablaze to the horror of the person he's trying to sell brake pads to. Completely unaware of what he's actually doing. The look on Richard's face is fucking hilarious. And yeah, it just, it's, it makes me laugh every time. So yeah, it's the uh, it's that model car scene for me. Nice. Yeah. So I guess we'll just get to it. What what are your like overall final thoughts on this movie? Uh, this isn't the movie I remember it being, and I remember it being a laugh riot. Um, not to say I don't laugh at it anymore. It's just I'm laughing at different things now. So I believe that really makes it a much not deeper, but more accessible movie than I realized it was because watching it in 95 and watching it in 2022, I'm still laughing a lot at the movie. It's just, I've, I've grown with the humor now. So I, I would totally recommend this. Um, I don't think anybody could watch this and not at least chuckle or have a few laughs at different parts. Um, I think it's a great introduction to sarcastic humor especially the nineties. It's just pretty prevalent today, but everybody today doing sarcastic humor are kind of shitheads. And these two characters are very lovable. Um, great acting, a fun story, a relatively short runtime. Um, yeah, I, I, I totally recommend this to anyone. I, I had a blast, man. It's a great movie. Really good movie. Well done, Ryan. You. I think this movie aged very well. Uh, minus the use of the R word, which wouldn't fly today. Yeah. Um, well, I want to play off what you said a little bit here. I don't think this is a different movie than when we watched it when we were younger. I think it's a movie that's made so well for multiple audiences that we're what's different. And we can well, appreciate yeah. the movie on different levels. When I was younger, and I mean, this is probably a lot more personal for me. I'm, you know... 10 years old. I've only been speaking English for a little while. Movies like this used to be my bread and butter for the slapstick side of it. Mm -hmm. Interesting. As I get older, the slapstick, it has its moments for sure. But I have now moved into appreciating more of like the subtle banter, witty insult type like comedy that kind of went over my head when I was a kid. Mm hmm. So I think this movie is exactly still what it was back then and what it was meant to be. And that is meant to be a movie that is different for different people, different age groups. Yes. I, and it I is should, definitely... Yeah, go ahead. I said I should specify that I I, I lost my train of thought there. One okay, second. then. Now, I, I know the movie itself hasn't changed. It's just, to me, it was a zany comedy and now it's more of a a hilarious character study. Yep. And I think that that's why it ages so well, because even today kids can still appreciate it for the same things, the slapstick humor, and we can appreciate it more for things like the sarcastic wit. Yeah. I, I think, yeah, it's a, it's a good movie. I think that the seven out of 10 on IMDb is very fitting. It's not mm -hmm. perfect. There is absolutely parts that you can poke holes at, but as we discussed about the pacing, it doesn't really let you linger on those. So it's, it's a good, not amazing movie. Yeah. It's an easy recommendation for a lot of groups, unless you are just absolutely anti-comedy of any kind. And it makes me want to pick Black Sheep somewhere down the road, because I the, I just I love the pairing of David Spade nah, and Chris Farley. I just want to pick another Busey movie. Uh, I don't know who you're talking about. Yeah, I think you do. No. No. Okay. Not ringing a bell. So that was our thoughts on Tommy Boy. If you guys want to share your thoughts with us, as always, we encourage you to hit up social media. We are on Twitter at BS Bargain Bin, uh, Facebook.com slash BS Bargain Bin. You can leave a comment in the YouTube section, or you can head over to BSBargainBin.com where you can find links to everything you need, as well as comments if you have a WordPress account. Ooh, that was a mouthful. 
Mm-hmm. So rumor has it you're picking next week's movie, and that, that makes me slightly correct. uncomfortable. But I'm not technically picking the next movie. What a swerve. What's going on here? So while I do want to encourage people to use the official channels for fan recommendations, that would be end of the month, last week, on Twitter and on Facebook, leave a comment for what you would like to see. I want to say thank you to a very good fan that we have had for quite a while right now and pick one of their movie recommendations. So Uh. on July 14th, we posted our review for So I Married an Axe Murderer. And in response, Zero Valen replied that they would like to submit, and it is the movie that I am going to be using as my pick for next week, the 1992... Jean-Claude Van Damme, Dolph Lundgren led Universal Soldier. It was a top secret government project. Pack them in ice. All of them. Designed to create the perfect soldier. No man would ever again have to die in the service of his country. Cryogenically preserved. Okay, guys. Memory clearance. Genetically enhanced. How's the picture? Pretty ugly. Very funny, very funny. Programmed to obey. They're at the tower. Okay, okay, here we go. Who are these guys? 30 hostages held inside the power station at the base of the structure. I said shut up! Go inside. Begin phase two. This marks the third successful mission for the Universal Soldier. But there was something they didn't count on. He's not responding. GR-44, do you read me? At the end of the mission, he became completely unresponsive. Inside the machine is a man. Do you really think the Pentagon would allow the regeneration of dead soldiers? Stop the girl. Shoot if you have to. And all it takes... Veronica Roberts, TNA. ...is one memory. But he didn't do anything! To awaken him. Let's go! Hit it! Traitor. Universal soldier. What the hell did they do to you? Don't know. But I'm going to find out. One can't be controlled. Buckle up. The other. Cannot be stopped. This mission has been canceled. I'm giving the orders from now on. I'm gonna teach them all. Are we having fun yet? The ultimate weapons of the future have declared war on each other. Jean-Claude Van Damme, Dolph Lundgren, Universal Soldier. Stop. That is an order. Zero coming in hard with that one. Until next week, have a good one. All the best, guys.